Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. James Brumall, an associate professor of history at Shepherd University, and I am the director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. Um, I'm extremely excited about today's program, which is actually um, a subject matter that was my, my great passion in graduate school. Uh, I drifted away from the Civil War for a while and eventually came back, but I was um, really interested in the New South era. And so today's presentation is going to center around that subject matter. And it gives me um, a lot of pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Gallo, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Nottingham. And uh, Steve is on the cusp of finishing his PhD, which is a pretty significant accomplishment. So he must be extremely relieved and excited about that. Um, but he is uh, from the States and uh, received his BA from Belmont University down in Nashville, Tennessee. And he very recently uh, has had accepted a role of the Gilded Age, Gilded Age and Progressive Era, um, a forthcoming article that uh, is derived from all dissertation research. And I've read a portion of the dissertation as well as um, another uh, sort of article in the works. And so we're extremely excited to have, um, to have Steve here today. So, so welcome. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to you and the George Tyler Moore Center uh, for hosting us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you all for tuning in. We got some good friends who are already checking in. Hello, everyone. I'm broadcasting again from Delaware, so I'm not in my, my, my home venue. Um, so please bear with me as I, as I work um, a very different type of computer and deal with my parents' internet, which is perfect from times, at times. Um, nonetheless, we'll forge on. So I, I, when, to start this out, I think it's gonna be useful to, to frame things um, a little more explicitly than we might typically otherwise do. And so the era that we're concerned with here is the post-Civil War era that's often referred to as the quote unquote New South. And as, as Steve's going to explain and explore, a lot of the Civil War era is going to, and the antebellum era is going to directly impact how audiences perceived and, and, and shaped their views in this period. But just to sort of get us started, get some, some broad ideas out there, can you even explain to us, Steve, when I say the New South or the New South era, to what am I referring? So it might be to start with some definitions and some broad sure. ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so generally speaking, uh, from a historical standpoint, when we refer to the New South, we're talking about the period after Reconstruction, uh, and we usually let that span until the beginning of the First World War. So we're looking at roughly 1877 to 1913 or thereabouts. Um, and what we're really interested in is the changes that are taking place in Southern society during that period, right? Whether that be social, political, economic, what have you, right? Whatever's going on in the South during that period it comes under the umbrella of the New South. Um, Right, how is the South changing itself, uh, trying to reinvent itself in this period after Reconstruction, where they're trying to rejoin the rest of the Union, as you, uh, if you will. Um, but we can also talk about the phrase New South that emerges during the period, right? There is a self defined New South movement that emerges in the 1880s. And when we talk about that, uh, we're talking about Southerners who are actively trying to create what they call a new South. Um, and what they really ideally want to do is reinvent the South's economy, right? The end of the Civil War brings uh, the demise of slavery, right? And therefore the uh, basis of the South's antebellum economy is gone, right? So how is the South going to bring prosperity back? Uh, New South boosters uh, believe that by adopting industrial capitalism, uh, they will bring prosperity back to the South, right? So in many ways, New South boosters in the period are trying to bring industrialization to the South in the style um, kind of established by the North 50 years prior, right? So it's kind of an effort to emulate uh, the North uh, by industrializing, urbanizing, um, but also trying to diversify agricultural production as well. 
through scientific means and new technologies, right? So move away from uh, single reliance on a cash crop like cotton, diversify, increase production, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so we can look at it in two ways. We can look at it in the historical way, overarching period after reconstruction, or we can look at this kind of specific uh, movement that emerges during the period. Thanks. I, I, I think that's useful. I mean, and I think it's also important to point out that there's a lot of northern capital that's moving down to the south that still drives this economic engine. And we're going to focus on an industrialized city for today's discussion, but it's important to note that extractive industries really um, become prevalent throughout much of the deep south, but also um, portions of the upper south. And, and so it's, it's a very different economic model than one that white southerners had understood in the, in the antebellum era, certainly. Um, and it doesn't necessarily achieve the type of uh, transformation that they had hoped. Um, sure. It's actually kind of a, a, a tale of, of declension once again. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's um, yeah, that's a really important point to bring up, right? Um, by definition, right, this uh, New South movement is reliant on outside capital, right? Because uh, the South is trying to remake their economy, um, they need to bring in money that they don't have <laughs> in order to make this transition, right? Um, and a lot of that outside capital is going to come from the North. So not only are they trying to transform the South's economy, but they're trying to show Northern investors that they're already kind of on the way to uh, progressing in that way. Um, so they need to kind of signal to Northern investors that they are capable of um, modernizing in the way that they say they're going to. Uh, yes, they kind of have to court the Northern investment, if you will. They need to show that it's going to be a sound investment. Um, for Northern capitalists to bring their money to the South, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And um, I know you all tuning in, uh, some of you may have, have, have read up on this area extensively, um, but um, in instances, uh, perhaps not. And so if you haven't, one of the, the sort of definitive works of this still remains very much C. Van Woodward's Origins of the New South, um, which I had read in grad school and um, was just a, a profoundly important book on how I sort of thought about Southern history and um, sort of charted my um, intellectual trajectory uh, starting at my, I guess my MA level, I read it with P. Carmichael <laughs> and uh, just ever since then I was enamored by Woodward, but since then there's been a, a, a ton of really good scholarship that has, has come out. Um, so uh, thank you all again for tuning in. There's a, a question here about the feed. At this point, um, the video will be available only through Facebook Live, but we will um, record this, of course, and then put it up uh, at a later date on our YouTube channel. Um, but participants cannot tune in uh, via Zoom. So just to address that one question that popped up already. A lot of longtime viewers are on here. Thank you very much, as always. I saw Rick, uh, Chris Meekins from Raleigh, with whom I attended grad school, actually, uh, and um, many others, Cam up in Gaysburg. We really appreciate you all tuning in. Um, so Steve, uh, you, you look at, I think, the area that might be the crucible of the New South movement, right? You look at a city that is profoundly transformed by the American Civil War, um, forever altered by that conflict. And so get us into the world of Atlanta, Georgia, and um, tell us a little bit about how this, 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 it's a pretty famous story, but tell us nonetheless how this city is changed by war and then how it fits into this, this new South narrative they're starting to create for us. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sure many of uh, your listeners are already aware of uh, Atlanta, Atlanta's fate uh, during the Civil War, but uh, it's important to look at the, its antebe antebellum history as well. Um, it's important to note that Atlanta has a relatively short antebellum history. It's only founded in 1837, um, and it's founded as a terminus for uh, a rail line, right? Um, and after that, it really explodes as a transportation hub for the South. Um, it's a really important um, connector for the coastal cities of the South moving into Northern and Western uh, markets, right? So it becomes a really crucial transportation hub for the South. During the Civil War, this obviously grows in importance, right? It becomes a crucial transportation hub for not only 
the economy, but for uh, the Confederate Army as well. It also becomes a really important manufacturing center uh, for the Confederacy, uh, second only to Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so this further uh, really creates a boomtown effect, right? So uh, what was an important transportation hub only becomes more so, uh, brings a lot of wealth and uh, importance to Atlanta during the war. Um, downside to this makes it a very tempting target for the Union Army. Um, in summer of 1864, General William Tecumseh Sherman lays siege to the city. Uh, before abandoning Atlanta, the Confederates uh, destroy most of what they think will be useful to Union troops, uh, and Sherman and his forces finish the job um, before continuing their march to the sea. Um, so the result is a really decimated city um, after Sherman's uh, arrival. Not only is uh, the physical infrastructure of the city destroyed, but the economy, the wealth that had been built up in that short antebellum period uh, is really gone as well. Um, but this changes pretty quickly after the war. Um, it becomes the headquarters for the military government uh, during Reconstruction, uh, headquarters for the Freedmen's Bureau as well. Uh, the state capital uh, of Georgia gets moved there in 1867. So this is all to say that uh, an influx of people and capital comes back very shortly after the end of the war, uh, which, which allows Atlanta to once again kind of rise in importance as a um, uh, transportation hub and manufacturing center. So by the 1880s, Atlanta is really booming once again. Um, and this quick recovery allows for a very uh, potent narrative of new South recovery to take hold. Um, boosters such as Henry Grady, who is the uh, editor of the Atlanta Constitution um, and kind of becomes the national spokesperson for the New South movement, um, kind of point to this quick recovery as evidence of the South's um, resourcefulness, their perseverance, right? It's by the sweat of their brow that they're able to rebuild uh, and uh, reclaim their former glory after the war. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so by the 1880s, the period that we're looking at, Atlanta is very much on its feet again and growing rapidly. Perfect. And, and I think it's useful to pause here. And I'm going to keep invoking C. Van Woodward today. And I, I apologize. Yeah. Um, like I said, I was very taken by him in grad school. Um, another C. Van Woodward book that is worth probably investing is when he when he, he sort of moved into a philosophical stage um, out of the sort of hardcore work of the historian. And um, he wrote the, the Burden of Southern History, which is a series of essays that he delivered. And one of the underlying themes of this book um, is that for white Southerners, the Civil War represents this catastrophic defeat and proves a defining experience, again, for the white South, um, insofar as to say until Vietnam, no other American had truly experienced defeat in the same way the white Southerners did. And, and so Steve is, is, is giving voice to this rhetoric that starts to emerge in the post-Civil War era that stresses the absolute necessity of sort of transformation, of, of rebuilding, of asserting a very specific identity to grapple with this defeat on their terms and then to take this catastrophic event and turn it into something meaningful. And, and, and so Grady is, is one of the big architects of this New South vision, one of these New South boosters. But again, I think it's, Woodward has a very telling description about how this impacts the psyche um, of the White South. So something that I just want to sort of highlight and, and, and make a nod to, because the other question in here um, is how that Old South narrative sort of remains. But before, mm -hmm. before Game there, which we're going to go to. We actually already have a question that that I'm going to, we're going to have to talk about. I'm excited about here. So um, Paul Lawson uh, uh, poses, "What is your single favorite volume on the New South?" He asks uh, Woodward or Ayers or another. So Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you first, and then I'm going to offer my 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 vision. That's a hard question. I mean, I feel like Woodward gets his own special place, right, as this kind of cornerstone. Right. So I think we'll set him aside. He's a league of his own. Okay. But I really like um, uh, Paul Gaston's book, The New South oh, yeah. Creek. 
a bit yeah. dated, but he it's yeah. written in I think nine. But um, it's a really I think a really dull book and really explains the kind of development of mythology that surrounds um, the New South movement. Uh, more contemporary, I really like um, New South scholarship that focuses on the kind of urbanization aspect. So. Ryko Hillier has a great book called Designing Dixie, which is yep. all about the tourist yep. industry um, yep. in the New South movement. And also uh, Thomas Hanchett's book on Charlotte, uh, yep. sorting out the New South city is also yep. really good. I would definitely recommend those. So Steve's already given voice to something that we're gonna talk about a lot today and that's his unique methodology. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pin that uh, for now, but we're gonna go back to that because I think that's very insightful. Um, those are books that I actually adore. I love uh, Paul Gaston's book. That was another one. But for me, Ed Harris, Promise of the New South still remains probably right up there with Woodward. Yeah. And one of the reasons why is he, he's so experimental in his narrative approach, mm -hmm. um, creating these kind of contrasting voices that clash throughout the narrative. And it creates a very different vision for the New South. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you for that, that. That question got me excited. I love love talking historiography. Um, but <laughs> I want to keep driving our discussion forward here. And um, again, Steve has, has brought up a couple of points that we're going to want to highlight and we're going to uh, do some visuals today too to help share. But in order to make this new South more palatable, if that's the right word, it seems as though the boosters have to continue to embrace the old. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, you know, in what ways um, do they, do white Southerners remain, you know, kind of faithful to the old South as they're trying to craft this, this again, quote unquote, new South. Yeah, it's really important to keep in mind that while new South boosters are trying to northernize the South's economy, they are also trying to maintain a distinctly Southern identity. They're particularly focused on uh, maintaining the social hierarchies of the uh, old South, if you will. Right, um, so particularly racial hierarchies are really important, uh, gender hierarchies, class hierarchies, that sort of thing. So they're trying to change the South's economy, but they're trying to also kind of keep this balance of um, antebellum kind of social mores as well. I find it really useful to think of there as being two sides to the New South movement. There's this outward facing side, right, which is the effort to conform as much as possible to Northern models, right? So you wanna project this image of modernization. Um, but on the other hand, you want to maintain this uh, adherence to antebellum social hierarchies, right? So there, ideally the New South would achieve a balance between the two. Um, and we can talk about how they try to achieve this balance, which I think is really important, right? Um, there are several ways they try to do this. A lot of it is keeping key antebellum figures visible as mm -hmm. all these transition, all these changes are happening, right? Um, politically speaking, you are seeing a lot of power remaining in the hands of uh, white men, right? Obviously you wanna keep conservative white men in control. So you have that. Um, also, former Confederate officers are a real mainstay of the kind of uh, PR side of the New South campaign. Right? There's no better way to get the public's approval of a uh, modernization effort than wheeling out the, the old Confederate officer to give it his blessing, right? Um, so there's that. But there's also this kind of broader mythology that's getting built at the same time that the New South movement is taking off. Right, the lost cause mythology is being developed at the same time that this new South push is taking place. Um, and you see a lot of overlap between the two. A lot of the same people who are arguing for a new South are also promoting this lost cause antebellum uh, mythology, right? And I don't know how familiar listeners are to what the lost cause really is, but in a nutshell, it is a public memory of the antebellum period, um, that's really an idealized version of the past, right? It um, glorifies uh, Confederate struggle. Uh, it 
paints this kind of golden age picture of the antebellum period as prosperous time peopled by um, chivalrous men and uh, uh, delicate women, but also contented black slaves, right? So it really elevates this uh, uh, idealized image of the antebellum period while obscuring uh, uh, slavery as kind of the centerpiece of that uh, antebellum history, right? So you see this kind of being pushed at the same time as you're seeing uh, the New South movement really take off as well. And I think it's useful to note, and I think that's perfect, and I'm going to go back to the boards here. One of my former students, Mallow, um, happy birthday, by the way. He just turned, uh, well, on the camera, I think we're 29. No, I was all right, but anyway. <laughs> um, he's up in Gettysburg, and, and he asks about the role of the Spanish-American War. And I'm going to tie that back to what you just said. And so, you know, on the one hand, I think Steve's exactly right. In order to make this more palatable for many white Southerners, this, this shift to quote unquote modernity, which is a problematic term, but the shift to modernity, they're gonna have to continue to embrace the old. But I think what's also so interesting is at, at the same time, there's a, there's a national mythology that's starting to emerge in which through a, a series of cultural markers, uh, through books, eventually film, once we move into the 20th century, that, that certainly support that, that deeply mythologized vision of the old South. And, and so Cameron asks specifically about the Spanish-American War, but I think what we can do with that question is pour, just put it more broadly, between the 1880s and 1890s, 19-teens, 1920s, the country is going through this process of, of reconciliation that David Blight, of course, explores so well in Race and Reunion. And, and what Blight argues and what most scholars agree with is that by so doing, they sort of simplify a lot of the causality and consequences of the American Civil War and, and push forward this narrative of, of mutual hero, heroism and sacrifice during the Civil War itself and start to mythologize what the Old South did or did not represent. And, and so whereas this movement may be growing as a microcosm in the, the New South to sort of support that vision, it's also in line very much with national thinking. And I think that's just a profoundly important uh, point to stress. And again, for those of you who are invested or interested in this at all, you can't do any better than David Blight's Race and Reunion, which is continues to sort of make the rounds um, as we're having a lot of important national discussions right now about what the Civil War did and did not achieve, what Reconstruction did and did not achieve. But I did want to sort of make, make that that point. Um, yeah, that's really that's a really important important point to. Uh, uh, emphasize, right? The, the lost cause mythology would not have the staying power that it does if the North was not receptive to it, right? The North wanted to buy into this mythology as well, right? It was a really good way for them to put the Civil War behind them to make these kind of investments that the New South wants, right? They kind of long for this um, idealized past as well, right? So yes, the North yeah. is very much uh, involved in this as well. And I would add also um, uh, Caroline Janney's book is also really oh, yeah. good. For yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, and it complicates Blight's narrative actually quite a bit um, in, yeah. good, in good ways, productive ways. Mm -hmm. And the nation that was able to sort of rally around the Spanish-American War, um, sort of this broader quest for imperialism, like by the 1890s, 19 teens, the United States has become this you know, imperial power. It, it's expanding across portions of the Western hemisphere. Um, so it, it, in any case, we're going we're to derail it here, but um, I think there's just some important things to, to put out there. But the, one of the reasons why I really want Steve to come on today is, is because of his approach. And um, as we've sort of rehearsed already, there's a lot of scholarship out there and it's, it's highly interesting, but Steve offered me some stuff that made me take notice um, of what he's doing in particular. And it struck me as both highly original and also as, as very unique. And so I want to make sure we dedicate enough time for that. I'm a terrible time manager, which you know, <laughs> I can tell you. Um, so I want to dedicate some time and energy to that. So what I think I'm really interested in, we've talked about all these broad ideas about how the Old South mythology is sort of circulating among popular culture, how this, this New South era is looking back to the past. But I think any thoughtful observer will immediately say, well, that, that's in the national discourse. How does it, it permeate culture? How, how, how do average 
Southerners, white Southerners sort of absorb some of these, this, this messaging. And certainly it's in speeches, certainly they can read about it in newspapers. But what Steve has done, which I think is so interesting, is he's starting to look at the built environment and, and, and how um, the built environment specifically in Atlanta is going to inform a lot of the construction of these, these larger ideas. And so at this st stage, I think it'd be useful for us to, to pivot into a bit about your methodology and your approach. And then I'd really like you to show the, the viewers some of these great images that, um, that you've, you've had and maybe we could sort of discuss through them. So, so tell us about what exactly you're trying to achieve, at least in the microcosm of what I read and, and, and why it is important for us to take seriously the built environment. And um, one of our, our, again, sort of longtime viewers was just down in the, the triangle and made note of um, Duke Homestead and other sites, historic sites, which um, were certainly part and parcel of, of, of this transformation of the New South era and the interpretation at those sites today sort of goes back um, to again, emphasizing the importance of, of, of the built environment. So um, with that, please, Steve, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll go back to kind of frame my approach. I'll go back to the um, duality that I talked about as inherent in the New South movement, right? So this outward facing and the inward facing, trying to achieve that balance between uh, modernizing, but also retaining Southern identity. That's really what I'm interested in. I'm less interested in how successful the New South movement actually is, right? Which is important, but um, I'm really interested in how our New South leaders trying to get their Southern uh, constituents on board with this agenda of modernization. Um, and I focus, I look directly at um, public spaces uh, in Southern cities, uh, specifically at large scale uh, urban parks in the style of New York City's Central Park. Because um, I, I really believe that they offer a unique means of looking at how this kind of attempted balance uh, is achieved. So on the one hand, these parks are very um, clear outward facing efforts to conform Southern cities to Northern models, right? Ever since uh, Central Park is opened in New York City in 1858, these kind of large scale parks, naturalistic parks are considered really staple features of the modern urban environment. Um, so any southern city that builds a large naturalistic park uh, is very clearly showing that they're attempting to modernize in the style of the north, right? So they serve that outward facing function. Um, but they also serve a really important inward facing function as well because they're controlled and designed environments, right? You can control the way people interact in public by making these spaces that encourage specific behaviors, right? So I look at the way that these spaces are designed to promote this kind of antebellum uh, social identity, right? How do they reinforce racial hierarchies? How do they reinforce gender hierarchies? All of that. Um, so again, I see the, them serving two purposes at once, really. Um, and within my project, I look at several Southern cities, Atlanta being one of them. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I think they are a very unique avenue to looking at this question of how they're trying to balance the new and the old at the same time. Um, and yeah, did you want to, uh, should I jump into these images or what do you think? Yeah, so we're going to go to a, a, a oh, and yeah, someone just uh, um, made a note of, of, of Richmond uh, as well. Um, uh, so yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to move into the screen share feature here. So. Um, I'm only on one computer again, I apologize. Um, so I won't be able to read any sort of comments or questions, but we'll jump in and out of the screen share. But I think these images are really compelling. And so let's go ahead and, and bounce to um, the screen share. Yeah, is that coming through? Yeah, that looks great. Um, cool. So tell us what we're seeing first here, Steve. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to just uh, kind of keep, give you guys a bit of context first. So we're, I'm looking at one, I'm going to talk about one park specifically in Atlanta. 
Um, and that's grant part, which you'll see here in red. Um, so a few things that I want to note on this map, right? So we have the center of the city here, if you can see my cursor, right, kind mm -hmm. of in the center of this map. Grant Park is about two miles outside of the actual city, right? So in 1883, when this is established, this area is pretty much completely undeveloped. Mm -hmm. uh, Lemuel P. Grant, uh, a former Confederate uh, colonel, uh, has his home out here and owns quite a bit of the land in the surrounding area. He donates 100 acres uh, to the city as a public park. Mm -hmm. uh, and his good friend, Sidney Root, also uh, involved in the Confederacy during the war, uh, is in charge of uh, designing and uh, overseeing construction of the park, right? So, so just wanted to give you a sense of where uh, uh, geographically we're working with here. And I'm gonna interrupt you quickly. Um, yeah. Not too far away, I noticed the soldier's home, which I assume occupied by Confederate veterans, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so not far away. This gets uh, built shortly after the park itself, I believe, if I have my dates right. But yes, uh, soldier's home uh, for Confederate veterans, uh, very close by. Um, and you'll see on this map, there are a lot of streetcar lines running to it. This is actually yeah. a railway map. None of those are there at the point that the park is established. Uh, Grant is actually uh, involved in one of the streetcar companies. So he has very clear economic uh, incentives for donating this park land, right? Uh, he wants to see development pushed to this area of the city to benefit his real estate holdings, right? So we can talk about the economic uh, incentives driving this, but yeah, so Grant Park, two miles outside of the city, uh, not in a developed area, hoping to kind of guide development in that direction. Okay. And we've got a map here of the design plan for Grant Park itself. Um, okay. And I'm gonna pull up another map in just a second, but I just wanna point out a, a few key features here. Um, you'll see these broad streets. I don't know if you can read the names on your screen, but they're all large, um, curving streets that are named after uh, prominent cities in Georgia. So we've got Savannah, Marietta, et cetera. Um, so these are gonna be meant for uh, carriage driving. There are some smaller um, paths that are used for foot, uh, uh, for pedestrians, foot travel. Um, and these are gonna go around a lot of hills. Um, Root, when he's designing the park, uh, very consciously is trying to work with the uh, natural character of the land. So there are a lot of hills in this park and he's gonna build around them. Uh, and then we've got some man-made water features that he puts in. Um, and up here in the top right corner, which would be the park's southeast corner, uh, you can see a fort uh, called Fort Walker. And this is the remnants of a, uh, one of Atlanta's defenses during the Civil War. Um, so this is included in the land route will work to restore this, but we can talk about that in a few more minutes, I think. Um, and I just wanted to put this up side by side with a map of Central Park. Um, just to visualize what I'm talking about when I say that this is a Northern form being brought to the South, right? If you just look very, very quickly at these two maps, you can see that the design is very similar. Um, the topographical features might vary, but overall general design, um, this is very, Grant Park is very clearly mimicking Central Park. You can see uh, the curvilinear drives. This is a mainstead of Frederick Law Olmsted's design philosophy. He's who designed Central Park, um, right? He consciously wanted the roads within the park to counter the gridded street of the city, right? This is a nat quote unquote natural environment that's supposed to offset the industrial city, right? So you're seeing Root adopt the same kind of curvilinear drives uh, for carriages. Um, you've got similar water features being put in. Uh, you've got expanses of lawn here as well, right? So Root is very consciously trying to make a miniature version of Central Park, if you will. Um, he 
within the park itself, you'll see these drives kind of go through really densely forested areas. And as I said, there are a lot of hills, so they'll go up these hills. Um, and the parks are emulating um, northern parks in both design and function as well. They're very much um, intended to be used by the same sorts of people uh, for the same sort of activities. Um, Olmsted would talk about uh, receptive leisure is what he uh, believed a park should be used for. So no sports, no exertive uh, game playing, anything like that. What you're supposed to do is go have a leisurely stroll, sit, talk with your friends, but really be receptive to the, uh, what he believed were the healing qualities of nature, right? Mm -hmm. So Root is again, designing Grant Park with these activities in mind. So not only is uh, form mimicking the North, but behavior as well. Um, but at the same time, Root is also trying to make it a distinctly Southern environment as well. Um, he, as I said, he tries to work with the natural and the natural character of the land itself. He definitely changes it. Uh, as I said, the lake is man-made. Uh, he's clearing trees for lawns. He is um, carving paths into the hills, right? So he's very consciously altering the environment, um, but he's trying to retain that Southern character as well. All of the trees and plants that he puts in are all native species. Um, and as I said, he's trying to maintain what the land would have looked like um, before the war. And at the same time, uh, he restores Fort Walker, that uh, the remnants of that fort in the Southeast corner of the park. Um, he gets the original plans for the park from his friend Grant, who donated the land. Uh, Grant was in charge of uh, designing Atlanta's defenses during the war. Um, so he gets the original plans from Grant uh, and he tries to redesign the fort at, or restore the fort as accurately as possible. Um, he gets cannons uh, from the state arsenal that he has put in there. And then he starts uh, kind of adding some relics as he goes on, some statues as well. Uh, this is a replica, or it's said to be a replica of the uh, lion that is in, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the cemetery, but um, it is a Confederate uh, monument to honor the Confederate dead. And there's a memorial to peace over here as well. So this is all to say, mimicking uh, Northern form and activity, but also trying to retain Southern character. So you can see the park doing both of these things. Um, yeah, and I think we'll, we can leave it there and we can talk uh, a bit more about um, what he does with Fort Walker if you want in a, in a bit. Yeah, so let's click out for a second. I tried to check on my phone for any sort of questions and it's just, like I said, I'm not very multitasking. <laughs> So if I'm reading this right, th these are sort of, he's trying to create like a didactic space. Like the space is supposed to sort of teach, right? So it, it's on the one hand, it's encouraging audiences to step, step out of this increasingly densely urbanized area and instead uh, sort of take rest um, within nature. But he also then at the same time has sort of painstakingly reconstructed a fort that's, you know, and we'll talk about this, I guess, some more, and then almost create like a museum that's, that's meant to teach. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they seem like, right? They're loggerheads. Yeah, well. Or are they? They're, they're not really. I think like, I, I view this as supportive of the new South agenda. Um, okay. okay. So yeah, let me, let me talk a little bit more about what he does with this fort. So not only does he try to accurately restore it to its original design, um, adding uh, cannons and war relic, right? But he then starts taking all of these mementos that he has personally collected um, mm -hmm. from the Civil War and he starts putting those in. So you're getting um, cannonballs or unexploded ordnance or um, uh, uh, various bits of shrapnel that he's collecting, those in the fort. 
And then he starts asking the public to donate artifacts that they might have. So you start getting this um, pouring in of all these uh, Civil War relics that the public has, uh, and they get very, uh, very strange. Like we're, we're talking about ranging from cannonballs to human skulls that have been dug up on the surrounding battlefield, right? So it becomes this kind of weird uh, hodgepodge menagerie of Civil War memorabilia. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really starts to emphasize this kind of lost cause narrative that I was saying becomes really central to selling the New South movement. Um, I should also mention that the fort was not called uh, Fort Walker originally. Uh, he names that after a Confederate officer who's killed during the Battle of Atlanta, right? So again, we're honoring the, uh, the fallen Confederate hero here. Uh, playing into this lost cause um, mythology. And he talks about it as a attractive feature of the park that will get people to come. But once they do, you start to see them, you, you can see them start to interact with this space um, as a, as you say, as a didactic kind of landscape. It starts teaching them what uh, their relationship with the old South, this mythology that's starting to be built, what, how should they treat that as subjects of the new South? And how does that relate to this broader modernization effort? So not only are members of the public coming and seeing these relics, but uh, Confederate veterans uh, reunions are held in the park. They frequently go up to the fort, handle the same guns. You have this kind of uh, mass recollection going on. They remember things in this kind of idealized, sanitized way. They talk about the heroism of Southern soldiers, the valor of those who sacrificed themselves, that sort of thing. So on the one hand, it's really building up this lost cause mythology and promoting it, spreading it out to a broader swath of people. Um, but then you can also see them linking that to the New South movement. And I think this really, I'm gonna pull up my screen one more time. Yeah. Uh, so because Fort Walker is on a uh, hill in a park, it looks out over the skyline. So when you go and stand in this fort, you can go and look out and see the manifestation of the new South as well. So you can stand in the old South and look out and see the New South, right? Uh -huh. And I interpret, the, interpret this as framing the New South as an extension of the Old South. Not only uh, is it an extension, but a means of preserving this memory as well, right? So rather than framing this force of modernization as a threat to this historical memory, this kind of space frames it as a, um, mutually uh, beneficial force, right? It's a means of preserving memory. It's a means of redeeming the South, um, that sort of thing. So you can kind of get this from this image, right? Stand in the old South uh, amongst, amongst these relics, look out at the modern environment and see them in conversation with one another. Hmm. Do you do you have any sense? And you know, I I didn't warn you about this. So this might not be fair, <laughs> but but I mean, do you have any sense of how people were responding? I mean, uh, you know, do, are there are there newspaper articles t talking about Fort Walker slash Grant Park? Have you uncovered, any, you know, people from Atlanta who who thought about this? Um, is that just entirely outside the purview of what you're doing? I think no. so. At, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really, that is like the trickiest part of yeah. this project I'm working on, right? Is measuring public reception, right? It's really difficult to do that, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I am reliant on kind of uh, the narrative that New South Boat Boosters are promoting about this space, right? So there's a lot of coverage that talks about this very thing about framing this, uh, framing the city as a a kind of redemption um, of these uh, losses during the Civil War. Um, and there's a really interesting one uh, that gets published in the uh, Atlanta Constitution that pretty much talks about what I was just saying. Um, it's a personal narrative by a woman named Maude Andrews. 
and she write she has a regular column for the Constitution, but she writes about a trip that she takes to Grant Park uh, in the 1880s. And she talks about this process of riding the streetcar from the city to the park. And she talks about this uh, as if she's being transported back in time, right? So hmm. leaving the modern city, sure. she starts seeing the countryside and she starts like, having these romantic visions of going back to the past, right? And then when she gets to the park, she starts talking about how she's finding all these plants that uh, she hasn't seen since her childhood, right? And she's kind of lost in this dreamscape of the natural environment that reminds her of the antebellum past that she's known. And then as she wanders through these paths, she eventually ends up in Fort Walker and she looks out at the cityscape and she's, um, it makes her sad at first. She says it makes her sad. And she says, oh, uh, seeing that really uh, took me out of this vision of my past. But then I started, I looked at it and I could see uh, down below in the valleys, so where these trees are uh, in between the city and the park, she sees um, cotton fields and she sees black people picking cotton. And this reminds her that everything that she's known, everything she cherished about the antebellum past is still there. And she explicitly says this. She says, I can look out on those uh, black people picking cotton and I know that nothing has really changed. Um, so as I look out at this redemptive cityscape, I can maintain this uh, uh, assurance in my heart that uh, nothing has really changed that drastically. Prosperity mm -hmm. has returned, but uh, I can rest assured that the South I knew and loved is still there. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, there are, to, to answer your question, there are sources that speak to this. It definitely takes um, some deciphering to uh, pick up on what is boosterish rhetoric and what is genuine actual perception, but yes, it's there. And I, I, I think and we'll probably bounce back out and see um, if we have any sort of questions as we're going along here. Um, it's interesting, right? And, and so I think one of the points that I really want, want you to, to highlight, and as we're getting up on our hour here, yeah. is how these spaces then are able to both construct and reinforce an Old South narrative, but also more importantly, are able to reinforce some of the prevailing from the pre-war era gender and racial hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So let's let's stress maybe those points sure. and get our audiences to really understand, I think, how the build environment proves so integral, um, yeah. really in this almost like cultural victory that occurs um, after this catastrophic military defeat. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so what I just touched on is kind of, uh, yeah promoting a certain narrative, right? But you can also look at uh, the way that people are interacting with these spaces during the period, which is also talked about in newspapers. Uh, you kind of have to dig to see what's actually going on as opposed to what's um, rhetoric. But um, yeah, so you can see these promoting the social hierarchies that I touched on in the beginning. So in terms of race, um, Grant Park is not segregated when it's first created. So it's created in 1883. There is no law on the books that bars Black Atlantans from accessing a public park. So they can go and visit that park if they wanted to, technically speaking. Uh, that being said, it is very much understood that it is a white controlled space. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of this comes in terms of exclusion. It's just kind of assumed that black people would not go and access, access this space. And if they do, sorry, did you have something to say? Well, just de jure versus de facto, yet another kind of new South histor historiographical debate um, that is important to stress that there are these de facto forms of segregation that prevail in the immediate post-Civil War era before the rise of, of, of Jim Crow. So it's just important to note that how these things are sort of unfolding on the ground. Yeah, you can definitely view these spaces to an extent, especially during this earlier period, as kind of a, uh, 
testing ground for what's going to work uh, yeah. in terms of uh, maintaining racial hierarchies. Um, but yeah, so Black Atlantans are able to access a space if they can get there, right? It is outside of the city, so it requires a streetcar fare, so there's an economic barrier. Um, but once they get there, it's under the very clear expectation that they will show deference and subservience to white visitors. Um, one of the ways they achieve that is through uh, policing. There are park police that are uh, stationed at all times patrolling the grounds. There are very explicit regulations of activities within the park. Um, you can, most of them are about kind of promoting this middle class uh, leisure that Olmsted envisioned, right? But um, this becomes pretty much a white middle class uh, sort of uh, set of activities. So there's police there. Um, there's, I've even found one article that talks about the police being uh, dressed in Confederate gray uniforms, right? So there's a very clear expectation that um, these will be patrolled spaces. Um, and on the other hand, uh, a lot of the way that Black Atlantis came in contact with the space was in the employment of white uh, families. Uh, domestic work is the number one source of employment for Black women in Atlanta during this period. So right. a lot of the times they'll be uh, in the park with, with white families during their outings, taking care of white children. Uh, also the public restroom in the, uh, in the park is exclusively uh, attended by Black uh, employees, right? So there's a very clear uh, racial hierarchy built into uh, the park itself. And um, so there's the threat of uh, policing, but there's also the threat of violence as well. There are definitely um, instances that I've come across of Black people who kind of flaunt these expectations uh, being uh, attacked and assaulted uh, within the grounds by white visitors, right? So there's a threat of violence, there's a threat of prosecution, right? So you can see the park reinforcing this kind of antebellum notion of uh, despite the fact that slavery is over, black people are technically citizens, right? Uh, and on the other hand, in terms of gender, you can see a similar thing going on. Um, the post-war period brings a lot of new autonomy um, for white women specifically. Um, you can see this uh, kind of greater access to the public sphere. Uh, mm -hmm. Women are being asked to work outside of the home, socialize outside of the home. Um, new transportation technology is allowing, allowing them to move the city unchaperoned in ways that they never would have. Um, that sort of thing. Um, so on the one hand, the park is a means of accommodating that. Um, it gives women a public uh, space to go to on chaperone that men can rest assured that they will be safe and protected, right? Um, it's kind of an extension of what the historian um, Sharon Wood talks about the uh, gendered uh, cartographies of the city, right? So where are the spaces that women can safely move on their own? Uh, and the park is kind of an extension of that. Um, and then once there again, you're seeing an accommodation of this new freedom, but also um, uh, reinforcing the idea that their rightful place is uh, in, the dis in the domestic sphere. So parks are constantly advertised as great places for women to host picnics, um, mm -hmm to kind of take on this uh, motherly role. Um, it is also advertised as a great place for men to spend time with their families, right? So trying to retain uh, the antebellum family unit um, despite these kind of radical social changes that are coming uh, on the heels of modernization, if that makes sense. It does. And um, one more book promise that'll be it uh, but the but the biggest critique of uh origins of the new south well there's actually a whole series of critiques but um women entirely absent from the narrative and glenda gilmore corrects that with ginger and jim crow and um she's now at yale as she has been for at this point i think several decades um but uh the final recommendation there and i i think that's a, a very powerful take there that you've offered and um one of our, our viewers has asked that uh, when we sort of 
republish this, um, that we do include some of those maps, which so I'm going to yeah. mean there, Steve. But I, I think they're invaluable, which is sort of, I think, the, the broader point that I want to conclude with. And, and you know, that is that it's a thing that I, I stress on here repeatedly um, for those of you who've tuned into to different programs that I've done, uh, it's thinking more broadly about evidence. And, and again, you know, the, 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 the letters, the diaries, the newspaper accounts, I think we're all familiar with that oftentimes are available um, in great numbers, especially as we move into the, the post-Civil War era, while invaluable, only give us some insight in, into how individuals sort of lived these experiences on the ground. And, and we can get at the lived experience through a whole host of means. But I think what Steve has exposed to us so well is, is the power of place and, and, and the record that emerges from the power of place through things like maps. Um, I think you had at the end, there was probably a postcard. Is that correct? The one that said, um, th yeah, some of these post postcards and just give us, I think, tremendous insights into a whole different arena of, of evidence that doesn't always speak to us in ways that we want. And, and Steve talked about some of those challenges, but if you're patient with those types of sources, they can reveal so much. And I think what's amazing to me um, is that barring a couple of the works that Steve cited, um, especially sorting out the new uh, South City, which is a great book, there just hasn't been that much done. And again, it's remarkable to me considering how much has been done in the, in the area of maps and, and material culture for the, early American period, and we're only slowly beginning to enter that arena in the Civil War era, and there's virtually nothing done, you know, in the, re say, the Reconstruction era. And, and so this is a really exciting field, really, within our field um, to start exploring. And again, I think as Steve has told us so well, it can, can reveal um, just an immense amount um, of information. And, and I want to conclude with a, a phrase that you used, which I thought was just really smart. Um, and you said, in, in a, I think it was extracted from the dissertation, pursuit of progress did not require abandoning all they had known. And, and that's the tension, right? That as the New South era is, is born, many people are easy with this idea of progress and modernity. And I, and I think the message is consumed in a way that audiences are receptive to, white audiences are receptive to, because there's so many markers of the old South that remain. And, and this park, I think, just puts in, in, in stark relief all these different tensions, all these different forces, and just is a wonderful case study, you know, again, part of your broader work, that reveals everything just in really clear ways that I think would be really good at actually through an analysis of only new records or say letters and diaries from the period. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really important uh, to keep in mind exactly what you pointed out in that this is doing very similar work to say Confederate monuments, right? mm -hmm. but it's much more subtle work, right? It, it's, affecting people's behavior in ways that they might not even notice, right? It's reinforcing these social hierarchies amongst the public when they're not even aware of it, right? You can go to a, a uh, public square and look at a statue of Robert E. Lee. And I mean, if you're gonna look at it critically, you can see uh, what's being done there, right? But if you're talking about going to a public park and behaving in ways that, um, Kind of conform to antebellum uh, standard. It's much more subtle, and it has real lasting power, right? Um, it builds this uh, southern identity into people um, in an almost um, uh, subconscious way. So I think it's an important way of um, engaging with uh, a lot of the problems that the country is currently dealing with, right? Um, we have to look critically at the built environment as as much as we do. Um, at statues, I think it's really important. Um, and I also just want to touch before we go uh, on the fact that I'm not making a claim that this is necessarily uh, a successful venture, right? So I see them, <laughs> I see them trying to strike this balance in Grant Park, um, but you don't have to look far to see that it's not really successful. So especially in terms of race, um, Grant Park puts out this message that racial hierarchies will be maintained despite these changes, but in 1906, there is a horrific um, uh, massacre of Black people in Atlanta um, that ends with 
vic bodies of victims being piled at the foot of a statue of Henry Grady, uh, very much uh, challenging the kind of accommodation that he was calling for in the New mm -hmm. South. So um, maybe it's too subtle uh, for people during the period, you might be able to say, but yeah, not necessarily successful, but um, important nonetheless. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you revealing. Um, again, Steve will have an article coming in the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Uh, he will soon be um, the successful recipient of a PhD, which is always an exciting thing, and uh, be moving back statewide and hopefully uh, flourishing in the academy. Um, for those of you who tuned in, again, we had a lot of our um, sort of longtime viewers. Um, your time, as always, is deeply valuable, especially in the middle of the day. I know it's increasingly hard these days to sort of balance everything. Um, I know I certainly am trying to do the um, family professional life balance and often unsuccessfully. Um, and so um, I really appreciate uh, just, again, people's continued interest in this and just wanting to learn more. I mean, education is, I think, of the most profound importance right now. And so um, programs like this, I think, can can be revealing and hopefully encourage you to pick up some of the books that we talked about. And I can um, obviously add to uh, comments on the Facebook page and to keep exploring um, sort of the, the, the legacies of the Civil War, um, which uh, take all sorts of different forms. But I, I think one of the really interesting avenues is through this New South movement. Um, and so with that, Steve, um, any parting words? Uh, no, I would just say thank you to you guys again, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, I really hope it was informative and uh, gave you some new ways of thinking about uh, this really important period in uh, American history. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you all very much. As always, stay healthy and stay well, and we'll look forward to seeing you on our next program. So thank you and have a wonderful week. Today is Monday, gosh. Um, so have a wonderful week. <laughs> And with that, um, we'll sign out. So thank you all very much.